you know, the title of this particular lecture, it says, what? Good people don't go to heaven? And it might be different from what you're used to hearing. You look at that and you say, well, how could that be? And uh, somebody asked me, they said, you know, if good people don't go to heaven, then I'm doomed. Well, have no fear. You know, there's a, there is a way to get there. You notice the word I use? Who's the way, the truth, and the life, right? Absolutely. So, if you think about it, most of the messages that you've heard this week are not traditional messages. They're not messages that you have heard in most churches. Isn't that true? I mean, they're very different. They're very different. They're different from what churches traditionally teach. They're different from what theologians like to say. But you know, it's amazing that when you really dig down and you see what the church knows, what these people know and understand that are the theologians, a lot of them know the things that we've been talking about. Some of them they don't know, but a lot of them do. And you know, these messages come straight from God's Word, the Bible. I don't know if you noticed that or not. I'm not quoting theologians. Now, sometimes to prove a point that they agree with us, I use some things from other places to show what they're saying and what they're admitting, for example, about the Sabbath message. All of the evidence that we have that other denominations recognize which day the Sabbath is. And the things that we've covered, as our brother Rick said right at the beginning, they're unpopular and they're politically incorrect. Not only from a worldly point of view, but from a, from a religious point of view, from both sides. They're, they're politically incorrect. To teach that you, you, we should be keeping the commandments of God, the world doesn't like that. They don't, because it holds us accountable. And a lot of churches don't like that either, because it holds them accountable to what are the commandments, what do they say. So let's just do a brief review of what we've covered through the week, and then we're really going to dig into some material, and I think you'll appreciate this. There's a couple of things I'm going to show you tonight that I didn't show you earlier in the week, and the reason I'm going to do that is because um, uh, we had an opportunity this afternoon. There was a sermon that was given uh, very recently in a local church to counter our, um, our lecture on the begotten son is God a trinity. I'm pretty sure that's why the lecture was given. I can't say that for sure, but I feel pretty confident because the timing was impeccable. If it wasn't, it's, it's amazing that it happened. So I want to cover just a couple of things that were mentioned in that, and, and I think you'll, you'll appreciate it. The first part of the week, on Monday night, we talked about God saying in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. We established that this was the Father speaking to the Son. We looked through texts that show that all things were made through Christ Jesus. And that's what the Bible says. In John chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Nothing was made that was made without Christ. Without Him, there was nothing that was made that was made. So Jesus is actually the Son of God, is what we established. We explained that, that we are made in the image of God. We talked about that. On uh, Monday and Tuesday nights, we learned how the father, through his son, created man. Man was made from the dust of the ground. And then where did the woman come from? She came from his rib, right? So we see in here uh, the fact that the man preceded the woman, and the two were to become one. The man preceded the woman, and then the woman came from the man. We see a type of father and son in the Bible, because when we look at this text, in Proverbs 8, we established very quickly, once we read through this, it says, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. Remember we talked about that bringing forth, what it meant? It meant coming out of, being the very substance of the Father. We established this was Jesus Christ speaking. It could not be wisdom because wisdom wasn't brought forth. The Father is eternal. He has always been, therefore wisdom has always been. The Son, we don't know of any Son that's as old as his father. And for some reason, in the Christian circle, this is heresy. When they hear that, they say, well, Christ has to be as old as his father because he's, he's divinity. But 
that's not what the, the Bible says. Yes, he's divinity, but it doesn't say that they are co-eternal. It teaches there is a father and a son. A son begotten, not created. There are a lot of people think that because we think that Christ had an origin, that we're saying he was created. We are not saying he was created. That's one of the things that was said this week in a sermon, that we believe that Jesus was created. Begotten is not created necessarily, especially when it's coming from the Father. Remember, we said a human begets a human, a dog begets a dog, a cat begets a cat. Divinity begets divinity. Jesus is a son begotten. It was mentioned, and I didn't cover this, the word monogenes, which is in the Greek. This is actually the Greek word for only begotten. Somebody said it means only unique. So I, I thought I'd put it in the PowerPoint. I thought it was worth looking at. And this is the definition for the word monogenes. It says, only born, that is soul. Soul means one. Only born, only begotten child, it says. They put that in brackets to add some meaning to what it means. Now you'll notice there's two other Greek words. I don't see the word unique anywhere in here. Nowhere in here. So to say it means only unique, where is that coming from? Because it's not coming from this definition of the very word that he was defining. It's very important. So we look at this, and this is a common misconception in, in Christianity and what theologians are teaching. But when I pin them down and I ask them to show me, they never can. They never have. And they can't because it just doesn't exist. So we look and you see there are two different numbers there. I don't know if you know it, but in Strong's Concordance, when you look up a word, each word that's in the Bible, and whether it's in the Hebrew or the Greek, has a numeric value. And you can look that word up in a concordance. And there are several different ones. Strong's is kind of the one that it's kind of the go-to one. There are some problems with it, and uh, we, can, we can talk about that privately. But I will say that overall, it's very, very good. It's very, very good. And right here in Strong's, each word has a letter, or a letter and a number. If it's Greek, it's G. If it's Hebrew, it's H. This begins with G because we were in the Greek scriptures. So this word monogenes, there's two other words that are attached to it. You notice it says from G3441 and G 1096. Here's the other definition for this word monogenes, which is monos. Monos means one. It says remaining, that, remaining, in other words, the remaining one. If I eat the whole pan of brownies and there's one left, that's the one that's remaining, right? So it says that is soul or single. By implication, mere. It says alone, only, by themselves. I don't see anything in this definition that says unique. The next word was G1096, which is uh, genomahi. I think that's how you say that, or genomahi. You always put the emphasis where the comma is when you're looking at it phonetically. So it says, to cause to be. And then the only way they could figure it out was to use the word generate. Generate, that is reflexively, to become, come into being. Does that explain the sun? the begotten son, to come into being. The father didn't create him, he begat him. We could say generated from himself, his son, just as Eve came out of Adam. Remember I made the point the other night, you and I and everybody that we know came out of a woman, but not Eve. Eve came from a man. So why is it ridiculous to think that the divine father could not have a begotten son? You see? So I just wanted to lay that to rest. The other thing is, uh, that is mentioned, I just want to say this, is the argument sometimes that's used is that God is love. We've all heard that. If we, were say, if we were to ask, what's God's dominant quality? We would say, love. True? So God is love. And, and the argument that was actually used on me by a pastor that I truly admire, and, and I love him dearly, he was effectively my pastor for a few years, is when I talk to him about this topic, he says, well, Mark, let me just simplify this for you in a few words. Here's what he said. Would you agree that God is love? I said, absolutely. He says, if God is love, he says, think about this for a moment. Love is an outward expression. If God is love, there has to be someone to love. 
That's what he said. So there had to always be the Son of God. He had to always be there for the Father to express this quality of love. And I said, well, you know, it says in the Bible, Jesus said to love the Lord your God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first commandment. And the second like it is to love your neighbor as yourself. Does that make me two beings? And he dismissed himself and said, I have a meeting to go to. You see, he didn't have an answer. For me to love someone is one thing, but you do have to love yourself because if we have no self-respect, that's lack of love for ourselves. It doesn't make us two beings. The father is a being, the son is a being. The father could love before the son was begotten, just as you can be alone and respect or love yourself. Does that make sense? So this philosophy stuff that they try to pull to defend their doctrines, it just kills me. I just wanted to touch on that because these were some of the points that were made in the uh, lecture that I listened to. So we also learned, and this is all just about the begotten son. And like I said the other night, I could talk for hours on that one topic. Let's continue. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. And this is, take a look at how this is worded. It says, for unto, unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the firstborn into the world, he saith, let all of the angels of God worship him. Why did I pick this text? This is a New Testament text that is pointing back to Psalm 110 verse one that talks about the son being begotten. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand, and also we see here that he said it in the past, and he said it again when Jesus was born as a human being. So my question to the Trinitarian is, what makes Jesus the son of man? And they say, oh, the fact that he was born of Mary. I say, yeah, you're right. Now, what makes Jesus the son of God? And you can hear a pin drop. What makes him the son of God? The fact that he came forth from the Father. That's what makes him the son of God. It's very simple. It's all throughout scripture. We can see it time and time again. So when we look at the word here for first begotten, also in the Greek, it means, it literally means first born. So in context, Jesus was begotten before creation. He was with the Father in creation and he was born again in humanity. You know the interesting thing? Jesus was born again when he was born from Mary. He was, divorn, he was born the divine son of God in eternity past, and he came to this earth, lived, was born again, and lived as a human. We're born as human beings in the sinful nature, and then through Christ, we're born again. Isn't that beautiful? So it's amazing how that works. It doesn't mean that we become divine, but the Bible says we can become partakers of the divine nature. It's a beautiful thing. It really is. How anybody can't come to that conclusion. And I'm telling you, I literally get goosebumps when I think about that. The relationship that's there. And, and to think that the majority of our brothers and sisters that are calling themselves Christians are rejecting and denying this Bible truth because it doesn't go along with what the theologians teach. I've spent more time here than I should have, but it's, it's so important. We discussed also uh, last, this past week that uh, they were Adam and Eve when they were created. They were created as righteous. They were both perfect and they were both naked in the garden, the man and his wife. And even being naked, they were not ashamed. Ed, can you move that mouse just off of the screen there for me? Thank you very much. And um, they were both naked, yet they were not ashamed. And we discussed that, that they were created as perfect, righteous beings. There was no sin in them. And when man made the choice, when Adam and Eve made the choice to eat from the tree, what happened to them? They lost their righteousness, their righteous robes, so to speak. Remember, they were created in the image of God. So we showed how God has a righteous robe. He's, he clothes himself as righteous in, in uh, light as with a garment. And they obviously had this type of garment as well, and they went from being naked and not ashamed to hiding themselves when God came into the garden because of sin. And what changed in Adam and Eve 
was the fact that they lost their righteousness and now they can no longer physically be in the presence of our Heavenly Father. So now we have to have someone to mediate for us and a go-between, so to speak. When he came into the garden, they were terrified. They went and hid themselves. And I asked the question, could you imagine going to your child and having them running and hiding from you? How would you feel? You see, the father and son made plans to restore this relationship. <clears throat> and this is where we're headed tonight. We're going to find out more and more about this. And this was a great cost to both the father and his son because he had to give his son. He had to watch him go through that. Put yourself in the, in the shoes of our Heavenly Father. Think about what he did. And, you know, when he did that, he risked everything. Because it, the potential was there that Christ could fail. But what got him through it? Reliance on his Father. And that's what we're trying to teach this week. Not reliance on ourselves, but reliance on our Heavenly Father through the Spirit of Christ that dwells within us. That's what we talked about last night. Okay? So he's trying to bring us back to a face-to-face -face relationship. We talked about uh, the fact that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. There it is again. It's that same word that we were talking about just a moment ago, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Wednesday, we studied how Jesus literally died. He gave his perfect life, the life that he lived. He lived a sinless life. And he bought back what Adam and Eve lost. They lost the right to living forever. That's what they lost. And he died, and when he died, we learned that when we die, we're conscious of nothing, contrary to what the majority of Christians teach. The majority of religions teach that there's an immediate afterlife when we die. There is a life after this one, if we die in this world, but it doesn't come instantaneously, though when I die, it might seem instantaneous because we lose all concept of time, just like when I go under anesthesia. Um, there are people who believe that Jesus didn't literally die. But then that would be not really a sacrifice, would it? If he didn't really die, I think Satan would have pointed that out. And we learned that it was the Father who raised the Son. And we have over 30 verses to prove it. There's a handout on the back table if you want that. Uh, I heard in a sermon uh, just this week that the uh, Son raised himself. Well, if he's conscious of nothing, how can he do that? It's impossible. 1 Corinthians 6.14, it says, God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. These are just a couple of the texts. Romans 6.4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. On Thursday, we discussed how the Ten Commandments are still valid today. They haven't been wiped away like I was taught all of my life. I was taught the commandments were done away with. And we just live by the principles. How do I keep the principle of I shall not commit adultery if I'm... How do you keep the principle and not actually do that? You see what I'm saying? How can I say I'm not going to worship a false god, but I'll keep it in principle? You have to do it. You have to not worship the false god. That's how you do it. These commandments show the very character of God, which is love. Remember the first four commandments as we look at them. These first four commandments all point to love of God. If I love God, I'm not going to have another god before him. I'm going to worship the one true God. If I love him, I'm not going to make a graven image and bow to it. And that could be any form of idolatry, by the way. If I, if I love God, I'm not going to take his name and use it in vain or in a worthless way. If I love God, I'm not going to profane his holy Sabbath day. And if I love my neighbor, I'm going to keep these commandments. My father and my mother. Well, I grew up in their house, but now they're my neighbor. They're my father and mother and my neighbor, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. If I love my neighbor, I'm not going to kill my neighbor. If I love my neighbor, I'm not going to commit adultery with his wife. If I love him, I'm not going to steal from them. I'm not going to lie about them. I'm not going to covet what they have. These are God's commandments. They're not recommendations. They're not just suggestions. 
And we learn that even in his death, Jesus kept Sabbath. You remember that point? That he died on a Friday, he was in the tomb. The only 24-hour day he was in the tomb was on the Sabbath day. So even in his death, he kept the seventh day Sabbath. Just as God rested on the seventh day from his work of creating the world, Christ rested in the tomb on the seventh day from his work of saving the world. What a beautiful truth. People aren't teaching this. We learn that the Sabbath was changed by the Romans and that that was prophesied in Daniel chapter 7. Boy, we covered a lot of information, didn't we? These are not traditionally taught. Then last night in the sermon, Not a Bandage but a Cure, we discovered this. John chapter, 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And that's where people usually stop because they want to live in their sin. But it says he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we talked about the fact that he wants to save us from our sins. This is why he cleanses us. And if we have the indwelling Christ, if the spirit of Christ is in me, then I, I can't sin, truly. I, it, sounds, it sounds strange, doesn't it? But if I truly have this, could Christ, he could have sinned, but what kept him from sinning? His reliance upon his father. So if we have the same faith that Christ had, and we allow the, the, as he allowed the Father to direct him, if we allow the Father to direct us through his Son, what's going to happen? I will not sin. I will keep the commandments. We talked about how the commandments haven't changed under the new covenant. There's an old covenant and a new covenant. The only difference between the old and the new covenant is not the commandments themselves, but the fact that they've been, they're not just on the tables of stone, but now they are in us. And we looked at numerous texts to show that. So we can become righteous as a result of what Christ does in us. Not anything that we do in ourselves. Take a look here in Jeremiah. This is what we were just talking about, the commandments being in us. But this is the covenant. This is in the Old Testament that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Jehovah. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it on their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. So the law didn't change, the location of the law changed. You see, instead of being on those tables of stone. Am I missing something, Rick? Yeah, I just want to ask the question. What law is he talking about? The Ten the Commandments. Testament. Absolutely, he's talking about the commandments. Very good, thank you for pointing that out. And I want to say this, I used this illustration. Ed, Ed said he really appreciated this, so I think it's worth mentioning again. In James, we talk about uh, the law is like a mirror. And I use the illustration, if I have a smudge on my face right here, I can't see it. I'm up here talking away, and I could have this big smudge right on my face, and, and somebody looks at me and says, Mark, there's, there's a, a smudge on your face. And I say, well, let me have a mirror. And I look in the mirror and it's, oh, yeah, I do. There's a smudge right here. Does that mirror remove the smudge? No, it doesn't. It simply shows me that there's a problem. Look, having the tables of stone shows me the commandments, but they don't take away the desire to break them. They don't make me not commit adultery. But if I have those commandments in my heart now, that's what removes the desire to do those things. Just like when I look at that in that mirror and I see that mark, the only thing that's going to remove it is the action of removing it. And what removes that, that sin from me is the action of Christ coming into my heart. It makes sense, doesn't it? It's very simple. It's very, very simple. And let me tell you, I've used that illustration many times before, but now that I understand the indwelling Christ, it's, so, it's enormous. It's not just an illustration. It really makes sense to me. And the vast majority of Christians believe that the old, the old covenant is different from the new covenant. It's no different. It's where it's located. It's not in that ark of the covenant anymore, in the heavenly sanctuary. It's there still, maybe. But that's not where it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be in this temple or this sanctuary. Right? 
So we find the same idea in Ezekiel, and we did that last night as well. We looked here. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. It doesn't say you might be able to do it. It doesn't say that. You will. You will. That was not a bandage, but a cure. It's Christ in you. So you may realize that throughout this week, we've been answering the questions that a lot of churches leave hanging out there, and they either avoid them, or they're not teaching what the Bible says. I hate to say it that way, but how else am I supposed to say it? This is a politically incorrect message. So we have to be honest. Political correctness is killing the world. It's killing society. You can't tell me I've got a smudge on my face. I just don't believe it. I'm just not, I'm not going to look because I know it doesn't exist. How ridiculous would that be? So the theme of this lecture, what? Good people don't go to heaven? And you might say, why would we have a title like this? Do good people go to heaven? Are there good people? You know, most people would say, well, I've, I've said it. I'm a good person. I treat my neighbor well. In fact, you know, I left the bank the other day with that pen. I drove three miles back to the bank just to give it back to them because I wanted to do what was right. I'm a good person. I treat my neighbor like I want to be treated. How many of us have felt that way? I'm, I'm admitting it. I have. And, and how many people feel secure in their salvation? I'm a good person. So I know I'm okay. I'm okay with the Lord. Is there danger in believing that ourselves that I'm a good person? There is. There's a danger there. Let's look at a few verses, see what the Bible says about this. Proverbs 21, 2 and 3. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but Jehovah ponders the hearts. To do justice and judgment is more pleasing to Jehovah than sacrifice. Remember, Jehovah's the divine name. We learned about that too. So what's in your heart? You, know, you always hear that commercial, what's in your wallet? God doesn't care what's in your wallet. He cares what's in your heart. I know a lot of preachers that care what's in your wallet. But what's in the heart? You know, if, if Christ is not in our hearts, then it's impossible to please God. Did you realize that? It's impossible. Notice the next few texts. The heart is deceitful. This is Jeremiah again, above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, Jehovah, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give to each according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. When it says try the reins, it means your innermost thoughts. It's actually talking about the kidneys, which is a vital organ. I try the reins. I'm searching through your kidneys. I'm searching through your deepest, most innermost thoughts. Well, if he's searching through there and he finds his begotten son in there, how's he going to destroy you? How can you disappoint him? Because his son passed the test. He came here. He did it. He lived the life. Next, Psalm 14, verses 1 through 3, it says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I've heard people say that. They acted corruptly. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. Jehovah looked down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there were any who understood and sought God. All have gone aside. Together they are filthy. There is none who does good. No, not one. Wow. Wow really sounds hopeless. It does. Look at Revelation chapter 3. It says, And the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, to the angel write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither hot, cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. In other words, don't sit on the fence. 
Don't sit on the fence. Lukewarm water. Yeah. You like a good hot shower? You like a nice cold drink? You see, he was talking to the Laodiceans, and they were known for their hot springs, so that's why he's using this. And they, they well understood what he was saying. Notice it continues. It says, Because you say, I am rich, and I have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich and white garments, that you may be clothed. Does that sound familiar? That the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Does that sound familiar? In the Garden of Eden? It says, And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase, and therefore be zealous and repent. You see, when we believe we need nothing, we're in a dangerous place. I've been saved. I've heard that. One of my dear friends, I love him. I've been saved. Well, when you look at the lifestyle, you'd never know that that person was saved. You see, it comes down to our relationship with God. We need to recognize our need for Christ in our life. And if we have Christ, he brings us to the Father. Take a look here. Mark chapter 10. Now as he was going, on, or going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, he's talking to Jesus, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. So if no one is good but God, where does that leave us? Let's look further. I want you to open your Bible to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. I know, it's, boy, you're listening to this, you're saying, wow, this is, whew. how in the world am I going to get to heaven? How do I get there? Romans chapter 3. And notice what this says. I, I want to start in verse 10. Romans 3, verse 10. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb, and their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of the asps, that's a snake, is under their lips. Those whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. No one is good, this says. None are righteous. So what now? Whew. Boy, you didn't think you came to take a beating like this, did you? It sounds hopeless. It really does. How can I get to the kingdom of heaven if no one is good, if I'm not good, no one is good but one, and that's God, and not one person is righteous, this says. What can I do? Listen to the words of Jesus. That's one thing we can do. Here in Revelation chapter 3, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Do you notice what it takes? To him who overcomes. I will grant to sit with me on my throne, and I also, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Who was speaking? This is Jesus speaking. You notice somebody pointed, Corey actually pointed this out to me. There's no knob on that door. He doesn't open the door and come in. He wants you, he knocks and he wants you to open the door to welcome him in. Jesus doesn't kick the door down and say, hey, pal, you're coming with me. He wants you to choose. 
we need to overcome. And we learned last night about how Jesus wants to dwell in us and help us to overcome. So how can I do this? Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Remember, Adam and Eve had a form of self-righteousness. I tend to fall into this category, friends, because I want to do everything on my own. I want to do it myself. I'm somebody who sees something and I go after it and that's what I want and that's what I do. And a lot of times I forget to consult the Creator and say, Father, is this what you want me to do? Guide me in the direction you want me to go. You know, we really need to talk to Him about every little thing in our lives. I shared with you last night about how I had that gas built up and I had this big belch and then I was, I, I was praying, I asked them to pray for me and they did. It seems insignificant. But I asked for prayer and this gas released and just about a minute later Rick says, we just prayed for you in a text. It seems insignificant. We can take anything to our Heavenly Father. You know, the Apostle Peter had some advice about this, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He had something to say about this. Here's what he said. Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. He doesn't care what color you are, what country you're from, whether you're rich or poor. doesn't matter. God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. How does this happen? Well, let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 17. I want to show you how this can happen. Acts chapter 17. There's a pew Bible. I'm sorry I didn't tell you that before, but uh, it should have the correct page number. Every now and then I don't do that right. So the Apostle Paul is on a missionary tour and he comes to Athens. And here's what happens. We'll pick this up in Acts chapter 17 and verse 16. It says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. So he didn't like seeing these idols in the city. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. You know, I just want to stop there because when we preach the begotten son, a lot of Christians say that's a foreign god but it's not. It's the God of the Bible. When we preach the, the Father and a begotten Son, we're preaching about the true God and His Son. It's not a false God. It's not a false form of God. It's not a false form of deity. Verse 19. I believe that's where I live. Yes. It says, And they took Him and brought Him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which He speaks? So He's, he's preaching the begotten Son to them. We want to know about this new doctrine. And it says, For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the Unknown God. Now in my Bible, that's all capitalized, that whole thing. To the Unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, Him I proclaim to you. You see what's happening here? Paul comes to this area and he sees these idols and he starts preaching to them about the begotten Son and his father. See, Paul was once a, a Jewish Pharisee. And he only believed in the father. And then he later come to know that Christ was the begotten son of God. He makes that clear throughout his writings. And so he goes and he starts witnessing to these people about the kingdom. 
And he goes on, and, and as you read through this account, I want you to notice what he says, particularly in verse 29. He says, therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. So he's telling them, having these idols is wrong. I appreciate that you, you love God, you want to worship God, you even have this one to the unknown God, and I'm telling you about this God you don't know. That's what he's telling them. But lo, notice verse 30. He says, truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. That means to turn back, to make a 180, to turn away from it. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. You see, the things that they were doing were wrong in God's eyes. And Paul says, I'm here to preach the truth, the gospel. Repent. Turn back. Turn back from your ways. Do a 180. Whatever it is in our life that's keeping us from doing the things that God asks us to do, from allowing Christ into our heart, we have to turn away from it. This is part of seeking first the kingdom. If there's anything that gets in the way of my worship of the one true God, it has to be adjusted. And I've had to make major adjustments in my life. Notice this in Romans chapter 1. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For, it is, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as, is, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, it might seem strange that he says to the Jew first, but remember that the truth was given to the nation of Israel first. And the reason that this is being said is because it was given to them first and then to the Greek because if, if they have the truth, they already had all the foundational truths in the Bible and the Old Testament, so they could have taken it to the Gentiles much faster than having to teach a Gentile about this one true God and go through all of those things. You see what I'm saying? That's why it was to go to the Jews first and then to the Greeks. Let's continue on. In the same text, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. In other words, if there's somebody that doesn't believe there's a creator, when they look around the beauty of creation, when you drive on the Blue Ridge Parkway or the Skyline Drive or you cross over 64 and you look across the valley, how can anybody say that that just happened? That there wasn't a creator? How can we look at the human body and how it's made and not recognize that there's a creator? He's saying there's no excuse for people who don't believe. A lot of them don't believe because they don't want to believe. And we continue, same account. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. So there are some that do know, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So in order to be righteous, as we discovered last night, we need the indwelling Christ, right? Isn't that what we said? The Spirit of Christ, which is the Holy Spirit. Notice this next verse. This is why I say that. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So the way to get to heaven is not by myself, not by being good, not by trying to do good things. I can't be good in myself, but by allowing the spirit of Christ to change me. The indwelling Christ changes us from the inside out, from within, and this helps us to overcome. That's what Jesus said. And it helps us to get rid of anything selfish. Again, here's that text. To him who overcomes, 
We have to overcome, friends. I can't state this enough. The only way I can do it is not through what I do. And that's why Christ is working on us, for us, and in us. That's what he's doing. Because he wants to save everyone. But again, he's not going to force you. Remember, there's no knob on that door. So many people believe that they're fine right where they are. I treat people the way I want to be treated. You know, I guess a good way to think of it is, what am I doing in my life? When I'm by myself, what do I do? Do I do things when I'm by myself that I, don't, that I wouldn't do if somebody were there? I'm talking about moral things. Naturally, you do things by yourself, but I'm talking about would I do something differently in a moral sense? Would I watch a particular movie by myself that I wouldn't watch if somebody that I wanted to impress were there with, with my righteousness? See what I'm saying? Would I watch a movie by myself if I knew Jesus was sitting right there? Something that I wouldn't watch any other time? Would I have the road rage that I have from time to time, and I do, if I really had Christ in me? You see, there are times that I believe he leaves me. <laughs> Some of the ways I get when I'm on the highway, I'm going to tell you. And he can't dwell in me if I won't allow it. So just think about that. You know, there's so many things in my life that I've had to rem not remove, but remove myself from. And I didn't do it because I wanted to. There have been times in my life that I've had to go into a room and close the door and get on my knees and pray and say, Father, I can't do this. I've told you about that. You in the back. When I knew I had to make a decision, I, was, I had to either leave the church that I was in, I had to make a decision. And I knew I could not leave that church because everybody that I knew and loved was there. All of my best friends and my family. And I knew that if I left, I couldn't do it. So I said, Father, I'm claiming the promise that you make. You said that if I'm willing to leave father or mother or brother or sister or husband or wife, that you will make it up to me. And I'm claiming that I can't do it. That's what I told him. So I had to give myself up and say, I, I need your help. You see, we need to examine our relationship. We need to examine it. And, it's, and you can't do it on your own, I'm just going to tell you. I know that for a fact. Because every time I depend on myself, I disappoint myself. Another misunderstanding is that Many believe that heaven is our final destination. So you understand how we get to heaven? It's not by being good. It's by the righteousness of Christ. I want to make that clear. That's why the title was, what? Good people don't go to heaven? It's not by my being good. It's not by, I took that pen back. That's a good thing, don't get me wrong. And it's good to have that because that's part of the law of Christ that's in my heart that made, makes you do something like that. Isn't that true? Because no one's good, according to the Bible. So many believe that heaven is our final destination. Is that what you've been taught? I know a lot of us have. Some of us may not. And we're going to see what the Bible teach, teaches. And what happens, not only when Jesus comes, but we've got to know what happens after that, what takes place. So let's ask and answer a few questions. What did Jesus say about the resurrection? Well, we covered this the other night. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. The King James says to the resurrection of damnation. So it's clear here in the Bible that this is speaking of two resurrections. There's one to life and there's one to condemnation. So you notice that all people are resurrected the righteous, and the unrighteous. That's interesting, isn't it? That that happens. The righteous are in the resurrection of life, and the unrighteous are in the resurrection of condemnation, or the resurrection of damnation. 
So that raises a question. What happens to the righteous when Jesus comes again? It says here in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, For the Lord himself, that's Jesus, will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. You know, this trumpet sound wakes the dead, doesn't it? So people who died in Christ who, or who died righteous will be resurrected and rise at the coming of Jesus. What about the living righteous? We're talking about those who died. That's what it says. Those who died will rise first. Then we who are alive, this is the same event, who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. So all of the righteous, whether they're dead or alive, will be caught up and meet the Lord in the air. The dead are resurrected that are righteous. The righteous living will be lifted up. And we're only righteous through Christ. Keep that in mind. This is also stated at 1 Corinthians, where it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we, that's the living, shall be changed. So the dead are raised at the coming of Christ, not before, as we have been taught many times in our churches. This happens at the last trumpet. And notice what Jesus says about the last trumpet. Oh, I'm sorry, let's continue. I, I got a little ahead of myself there. This is a continuation of 1 Corinthians 15. It says, for this corruptible, this body that's sinful and dies, has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality. So this body of corruption will be incorruptible. This body that dies will put on immortality or deathlessness, we could say. And then the account continues here. The next verse says, So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, O death, where is your victory? The dead in Christ are the righteous that we're talking about. So that raises another question. What happens to the unrighteous when Jesus comes again? Take a look. 2 Thessalonians 2.8, it says, And then the lawless one, remember we're talking about having the law in your heart? If there's no law in your heart, then you're lawless. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Lawlessness is unrighteousness. If you're righteous, the law is in your heart. You have the law. So the unrighteous who are dead when Christ comes remain dead. The unrighteous who are living when Christ comes, it says he will destroy with the brightness of his coming. They are dust. They're dust during the thousand years. Let's talk about that for a moment. What happens to Satan when Jesus comes? Now we recognize that Satan has been bound to the earth, right? He's been quarantined here so he can, he can do no harm to the rest of the universe. That happened... I believe about 2,000 years ago, according to John chapter 6, he was cast out. According to Revelation, he's been cast out of the heavens to this earth. So what happens to Satan when Jesus comes? Take a look here. We're going to look at uh, Revelation chapter 20. It says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So what happens to Satan? He's bound. He's in this bottomless pit. So that raises the question, what is the bottomless pit mentioned there in Revelation 20, verse 3? Well, if we be begin in Genesis, remember the analogy that I used, that if our theology is off in the first book of the Bible, in the first 12 chapters, it's going to be off somewhere else. If we're building a deck, it's got to be square in the first few feet. Otherwise, the further we get, the more out of square we're going to be. It's no different when our, with our doctrine. So notice what we find about this phrase, bottomless pit. In Genesis. Now you don't see that phrase, do you? 
It says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now, the word deep used in this verse in Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 2, is the exact same word that's used in Revelation, even though this is a Hebrew word, we have a Greek word, there's a book called the Septuagint. Have you ever heard of the Septuagint? The Septuagint is actually a translation of the Hebrew into Greek. And the Septuagint was around in the first century when the apostles were walking around on the earth. So when we look at the Septuagint, we find that the same word is used in Revelation. So here we have the bottomless pit. The word is abusos. Abusos in the Greek Septuagint, which is abyss. And it means without form and void. You see, so according to Revelation, this is what the earth will be during the thousand years. Evidently, this is what the earth was before God began his, his days of creation. Because it was without form and void. In other words, the devil is going to be here. Remember, all of the, the unrighteous have been slain by the brightness of Jesus' coming. All of the unrighteous dead have remained in the graves. Where are all the righteous? They're in heaven. So here they are trapped in this abyss-like state somewhere. There's no one for the devil to tempt. They're stuck here. So once I'm in heaven and Satan is bound, what happens next? Let's go to the Bible for every answer. Revelation 20, verse 4. It says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So Satan is bound for the thousand years. The righteous are in heaven living and reigning in heaven with Christ, according to this. Where are the unrighteous? They're dead. They're in their tombs. They're, they're dust. The living unrighteous were destroyed, or the living righteous were destroyed by the brightness of Christ's coming. And it says, judgment is committed to them. Committed to who? Has to be to the righteous. What does this mean? What's this mean? Judgment was committed to them. Well, take a look at this verse in 1 Corinthians 6, 4. Paul says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If we're righteous, aren't we the saints? Absolutely. See, the righteous while in heaven will participate in a judgment during the thousand years. And you say, well, what, what do you mean by that? Well, if we're going to be judging the world and we're going to be in heaven, you see, during the thousand years, every person who has ever lived on earth will be either in one of two places. They're either going to be in heaven, if you're righteous, or they're going to be dust and dead. Isn't that right? So those who are in heaven will be part of the judgment. And what we're going to be doing is judging the judgment of God. We're putting him on trial, so to speak. I want you to notice the following. Then I saw, this is Revelation chapter 20 again. I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Now we know that the dead unrighteous are in the tombs. How are they standing before God? Look what it says. And books were opened. Plural, books. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. So you see there were books opened. Which one is the book? It's the book of life. Everyone in heaven is written in the book of life. So the books are the books of the deeds of those who are unrighteous. We're reviewing. You see, I don't know if you know this or not, but if you look at... at Ecclesiastes, it says here, let us have the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So when I go back to this text and I see there were these books opened, what are we doing? Well, if I'm in heaven and I look around and I see, I see Alan up there, and I say, oh, you know what? 
I, I've known Alan for a long time. I'll bet you there's some skeletons in his closet. And I go over to the Book of Life and I open it up and I look and there's Alan's name right there. And I want to see what he's done. You know what's going to be there? Nothing but the blood of Christ because Amen. he's washed clean. Amen. He's righteous. He's there in heaven. But let's suppose I turn around and, and my buddy, Jack, Jack's not there. And I said, you know, Jack was a good man. I mean, he did all these things for the church and he was at Bible study every week. He, he came every, I saw him all of the time and all of the things he did. And I look over here in the, in the, in the books and I find Jack's name. I say, ah, Jack was having an affair. I, I didn't know. Jack was stealing from his employer. And, and what's that do? That vindicates God's name. God says, I want you to see why your friend isn't here. This is why the books are opened. We're not making the judgment on those people. The judgment's already happened. We're judging the judgment of our Heavenly Father. He is completely transparent with us. He wants us to know this is what sets His name free. This is how we know we can trust Him. So when I read a text like this in Ecclesiastes, and it says, including every secret thing, all of our records, there's a transcript of my life written somewhere in heaven, of every life in here. There's a transcript of every deed. Every word that's coming out of my mouth is being recorded in heaven somewhere. Every thought that I have, every deed that I do, everything that happens, it's being recorded. And if I have Christ in me, I can be washed clean. Revelation chapter 20, verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. So during the thousand years, we'll be reviewing the records and judging those who are not in heaven, and we'll be clearing the record for our heavenly Father and his Son, showing that judgment was true and just. What about reigning with Christ? Because it says we will reign with him for a thousand years. If you notice here, it says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, coming from the church that I come from, they say, well, if you're going to reign with Christ, you've got to have somebody to rule over. But I believe this is talking about reigning over death. You know, none of us, Methuselah lived 969 years. He has never, no one's ever lived a thousand years in recorded history that we know. The oldest man in the Bible was Methuselah, 969. So during that thousand year period, with Christ in heaven, will reign over death. So it's beautiful when we think about these things. So what have we learned so far? Let's do a brief review. The earth is in total blackout. It's a bottomless pit. That also says it in Jeremiah. I know that I didn't go over that scripture there. During the thousand years. Satan and his angels are forced to stay on earth. They're bound. Number three, the righteous are in heaven participating in a judgment of some sort. That's what it says. We just read that text. And number four, the wicked are all dead. So the next question that must be answered is what happens when the thousand years are finished? Because we always stop in heaven. We always say, and, and that's the truth. We can't wait to get to heaven. None of us can. I mean, we want to see it, right? We want to get that behind-the-scenes tour, so to speak. So what happens when the thousand years are finished? It says here very clearly, Gen uh, Revelation chapter 20, it says, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. So what happens? This is the second resurrection. Remember there were two resurrections? A resurrection of the righteous, that's the first resurrection, and a resurrection of the unrighteous. The second resurrection occurs after the thousand years. It says it right here in Revelation 20, verse 5. The rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. You want to be in the first resurrection, friends. Amen. Because if you're in the second resurrection, it's over. It's done. This is why we need the righteousness of Christ. So what do those resurrected unrighteous ones do? Take a look. It tells us right here. 
Uh, Revelation 20, verse 9, they went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. You see, if we do a study of Revelation, we find that the holy city, the new Jerusalem, comes down to the earth. And when it comes down to the earth and all of God's people are in it and it settles on the earth, they want to take. Satan is going, he might claim that he resurrected them. We don't know. Any way he can use to deceive them. He's already got them. They've already been judged. They have failed to get to the kingdom. The second resurrection occurs after the thousand years. So they're going to try to overtake the city. And what happens next? Revelation tells us in the same verse. Then they went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. You see, we're inside the city unharmed. The Father and the Son are in there with us. You see? It's just like the Hebrews in the fiery furnace. They were protected. Even though they were in the midst of the fire. It's, it's, it's kind of like Noah being in the ark. He was in the midst of this flood, but he was saved, him and his family. You see, the, the seven last plagues in, in Israel, the first three affected everyone, but the seven last one only affected those who weren't doing the will of God. We will be protected. The destruction is going to be unlike anything we've ever seen. We don't have any record of God ever destroying the devil or an angelic creature of any kind. But this says, fire came down and devoured them. I want you to notice the next verse. In Malachi it says, and you shall tread the wicked, I'm sorry, and you shall tread under the wicked, yes, and you shall tread under the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day which I am preparing, says Jehovah of hosts. So fire will come down from heaven, not up from hell, like a lot of people think, and it will destroy them. In fact, let's turn here. I want you to see this. In Ezekiel, I'm really out of time, but this is so important, friends. There's so much more material that I'd like to cover. If you guys don't mind, I'll continue for just a little longer. Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. I want you to see this because so many people have this idea that Satan will be in hell tormenting people for eternity. My understanding is that only the righteous have eternal life. That's what the Bible says. Is Satan righteous? So what, get, what would give him tormenting people for eternity? He loves tormenting people. This is what he does. Why would God give him hell duty and say, here, have at it? Notice what this says. Ezekiel chapter 28, and I want to start in verse 11. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord, that's Jehovah, came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says Jehovah God. Now, a lot of pastors like to apply this to the king of Tyre, but they realize once they get into the text, it's not talking about just the king of Tyre. Because notice what it says. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. The king of Tyre wasn't in Eden. Let's see who this is talking about. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. Who's this speaking of? Satan. Satan before he fell. Lucifer, that's correct. I establish you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I, what's it say? I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes where? Upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. Isn't that interesting? Look at the next verse. 
And, and all who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. So where does this doctrine that he's going to be tormenting people in hell forever come from? From Greek mythology, not from the Bible. But we've, most of us have been taught that he torments people forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. That's what we've been taught. But this says we'll be walking on the ashes on the earth. Why? Because the earth is laid bare and then God rains fire from heaven. Next question. What happens next? It's kind of exciting and it's almost, this is like a huge production, but this is much better because this is reality. This is reality. What happens next? So where were we? The fire came down out of heaven. Right? What happens next? Here's the answer. Revelation 21.1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. It's the same terra firma. The globe will always exist. It's just been cleansed by fire, we could say, refined. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Is this a new idea? You know, most people stop in heaven. But we're told, even by Jesus, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. He even in his Lord's Prayer, he said, and in this manner, this therefore pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What's that name? Jehovah. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? In earth, in earth as it is in heaven. Psalm 37. This is not a New Testament idea. This was in the Old Testament. This is, and Jesus knows this, of course. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on Jehovah, they shall inherit what? The earth. It is but a little while, and the wicked shall, be, shall not be. Yea, you shall search his place, and he shall not be. See, the wicked aren't going to exist. But the meek shall inherit the earth. This is what Jesus was praying for. And shall delight themselves in the overflowing of peace. It's beautiful. Psalm 37, 22. For his blessed one shall inherit the earth, and those cursed by him shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the earth and live on it forever. You notice, it doesn't say good people. The righteous. How do we become righteous? Through the Spirit of Christ dwelling in us. Again, Isaiah chapter 11. The wolf, shall, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. And then it says, and the calf, and the young lion, and the a fatling together, and a little child lead, shall lead them. This is beautiful stuff. It shows that the earth is going to be renewed. You know, Adam and Eve, I wanted to read, and we're not going to do this, I wanted to read all of Revelation 21 and all of Revelation 22. But I want, what I would like to do, since we are a, a here, uh, and I might do this in a sermon, I might do this in the upcoming weeks on a Sabbath, uh, for the sake of those who are tuning in. But what I would like to do for those of you here, if you come on Wednesday night, we can do this. And it will be really good to go through step by step and see what Revelation 21 and 22 say. It is absolutely beautiful when you read it. So the problem is, friends, in spite of all of this truth, there are people who are going to reject it. What about them? What do we do today for them? By the way we live our lives, that means a lot. We have to practice what we preach. We have to walk the walk if we're going to talk the talk. You see what I'm saying? I'm a Christian, but I'm out here doing all these other things. If we have the Spirit of Christ in us, that's not going to be the case. Take a look at this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. Lawless, again, if we don't have the law, what is that? It's, it's unrighteousness. With all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they may be saved. It's not that Christ isn't trying to reach them. He's knocking. That's why we do these series every year. That's why we're here every week. That's why we have the Bible study Wednesday night after Wednesday night after Wednesday night. And sometimes we re rehash the same thing because people have questions. That's okay. 
That's okay. We'll do it a thousand times if we have to. It doesn't matter. Notice this. And for this reason, and we just read uh, 9 and 10, they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. That they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And some people look at that and say, well, that's horrible. Well, no, it's not. God is allowing you the choice. We have the choice. He's not saying, you're going to believe me regardless. He says, I want you to believe me. I'm presenting it for you. I'm giving you a way out. I'm giving you a way to eternity. Accept it, and we're good. But if you reject it, you can't be unrighteous and live in the kingdom of heaven. If you're being unrighteous, you wouldn't be happy there anyway. It just wouldn't happen. If we choose not to believe God, that's our choice. He'll, and he will not deny that freedom. Next, just a few more texts I want to share with you. Revelation 22, 14 says, Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. You notice keeping the commandments here. And again, how do we do that? Not in ourselves. The commandments have to be written in our hearts. And the interesting thing is, notice it says they will have a right to the tree of life. Where was the tree of life? It, that's where it is now. It's in heaven. It was in the Garden of Eden. There was a tree of life, and then there was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? So if we do his commandments, we'll have a right to that tree of life. What did that tree of life give them? Eternal life, as long as they ate from it. You see? God promises us that he will clothe us. Remember he clothed Adam and Eve? He promises us that he will clothe us with the righteousness of his son. Look, after these things, I looked and behold, a great multitude which no one can number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes. White is righteousness with palm branches in their hands, crying with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. How much does the Father and Son love you? It says here, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by the glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Didn't I mention that earlier? Partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Be confident of this very thing, Paul says in Philippians, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it till the day of Christ. This is good news. So it's not doom and gloom. It can be. It surely can, if that's our choice. John, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have the choice. Some believe that once we're saved, we can't be lost. I have to show you a couple of more texts. For if after they escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. And it continues. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returned to his own vom returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. And some say, well, I just won't learn about it. You're in just as bad a spot if you refuse to learn. There are some people who never had an opportunity. I believe they'll be shown mercy based on their circumstances. God is a God of love. He sits on a mercy seat, as Rick preached earlier. It was a really good sermon. So, uh, just, I think, two more texts. I will greatly rejoice in Jehovah. My soul will be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the robes of salvation. He covered me with the robe of righteousness. 
The robes that Adam and Eve lost, he gives back to us. Like a bridegroom adorns himself with ornaments, and like a bride adorns herself with her jewels. So the righteous robes that Adam... You see how it went full circle? Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. They fell. God makes a way for them to come back to him. He makes clothing for them, pointing to the sacrifice of Christ. Christ comes. He lives a life. He, he dies without sin. He's resurrected. And then he gives us a way after in heaven to come into us and help us to overcome to get to the kingdom. Amen. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Revelation 2.7. This is our last text of the night. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. This is why I wanted to read Revelation 21 and 22, because it covers some of these things. So the beautiful garden that God created in Eden, the whole globe will be restored to that condition. It's wonderful. Our last question. Will the righteous people who are raised in the resurrection ever die again? We read text tonight. Death is swallowed up in victory. The answer is the righteous people are granted immortality. The righteous are granted immortality. The unrighteous will be in the dust forever. It's unfortunate, but we see this picture here of Jesus, he's the lamb. John said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And, you know, when we see his glorious coming in the clouds, what a beautiful thing that's going to be. You know, Satan has deceived the majority of people into believing that God is going to torment people for eternity, that the devil lives forever, that God is some... Uh, triune God. They're believing all of these false concepts. That's right where the devil wants us. But when we know the truth of God's word, when we know and we understand who God is, when we know and we understand that when we die, we're truly dead, when we understand that the earth is going to be recreated, that sin is going to be wiped away, sin wouldn't be wiped away if the devil is still tormenting people who had sinned forever. So it's through the righteousness of Christ. Good people don't go to heaven. Righteous people go to heaven and live forever on a new earth.